Howdy friends, Craig here. Welcome to our first session of Blades in the Dark. Now, if you have not watched our session zero, I highly recommend you go check it out. Uh, you get to learn about how these characters were created, but it's not required. If you just want to jump into the action, you're in the right place. This is going to be uh, multiple, multiple parts because session one took uh, over four hours. So we're going to break it up into smaller segments. Uh, sit back and enjoy our first session of Blades in the Dark. Hello everybody, Craig here on the third floor and we've got some Blades in the Dark. Uh, so we've got my entire cast here. Now I realize that some of you uh, may have watched the Session Zero, that's where we learned uh, about each of the characters. For those of you that did not see the Session Zero, we're going to learn about these characters, these scoundrels, as we play. It is crime time, is exactly right. Um, so probably the best way to get things started is let's go ahead and set the mood. So I want you to imagine the screen, it fades in from black. It's revealing a brown toned cluttered room. There's bookcases and rusted file cabinets encrusting the walls. The ceiling, it just feels six inches too low. And there's a smell of subterranean grime floating through the stale air. Bound tomes standing up, laying down on their side and stacked, fill the bookcases along the walls. Dust and cobwebs obscure some of the books. Some are untouched or for who knows how many decades. Other volumes are fresh and mixed in between the other hardcovers. Mismatched furniture litters the musty room. There's a wood stool, there's a couch held together by stains and mold, and an out of place expensive wooden desk. So the camera moves closer to the grand roll top desk and we see a slender woman in her early thirties. She seems tall even when she's sitting and her white hair is neatly cut just above her shoulders. She has a long coat on, still wet from the outside chilly rain, and she reaches into her jacket pocket aimlessly. With a look of surprise on her face, she pulls out a creased brown piece of paper. She unfolds it and starts to read. As the scene fades and the camera goes dark, we see her smirk as she's finishing the letter and remembering what had just happened an hour earlier. You guys can hear my Alexa. <laughs> Great for the boot. <laughs> so now the camera fades back in from black. The camera's high above the city of Duskville. The electro fence surrounding the town keeps the demons out and much of the dangers in. We see a spider web of streets painted with a gray palette. The rain soaks the roads and the electroplasm street lamps look like stars from this high above the municipality. We then zoom in down closer and we start to see people scuttling through the streets. Some are walking slowly and alone or some are walking briskly, like they're anxious to get somewhere, maybe somewhere safe or maybe they're running away from something, maybe a threat. The constant drizzle of the rain creates a low drone as it hits every surface of the city. The shot then widens and the cobble roads and buildings made of stone and wood are awash in grays and blues and the greenish light from the electroplasm street lamps and the windows add a little bit of color to the smog colored buildings. We smash cut to an alley tucked away from the main streets of the night market district. This is a favorite hunting ground for the Umbral Means crew. 10 uniformed city watch officers in their blue coats pressed the faces of a white haired woman, the same white haired woman against the cold bricks. She's wearing the same long coat. We saw her with uh, at her desk and her cheek is cold from the wall, but she's sporting the same smirk. Now pacing down the middle of the alleyway between the four scoundrels being pressed against the walls 
is somebody else in a blue court uniform, but it's an officer's uniform. It's Mick Wheatley. He's an inspector for the City Watch. He's tall, and his blue and black uniform just doesn't quite seem to fit right. In fact, you have a feeling that anything he wears wouldn't quite fit right. See, Inspector Wheatley, uh, Wheatley is barely 30 years old, and he looks too young to be in charge of anything. All right. So you four have been walking all around my city, and you've been doing it for a while now. And I don't know what you've been up to. I don't know what kind of shenanigans you are. But you're running with Spooky Girl. So I know you're up to no good. Each of you guys just feel the weight. So for some of you, it's taken two of these City Watch guys to press you against. But all of you can see Wheatley walking up and down the alleyway. Then he stops right behind Reagan, Joe's character. And he leans in and he whispers. You've been keeping your mouth shut for a while, little girl. And that's good. But from now on, we're even. Congratulations on your uh, promotion. The camera fades to black again. Now we're back to the, where we started. This brown room, and it's, it's, it's kind of a study. Um, it's, it looks like, obviously, some sort of basement. And we go back to Reagan, who we now know, sitting there. And she finishes reading the note. Let me... You know, Reagan, maybe you want to read the note out loud? Sure. Do, 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 do. Am I being shown this note? You should be. Is it not showing on your screen? Uh, not yet. <laughs> all right, so that makes it a little bit tough. I'm going to get show to all players then. And then, then we're going to do it. Oh, yeah. Uh... Townhouse between the Lost Water and Sweetwater. Canals in Silkshaw contains evidence that will be used to blackmail Lisa Freig. Stay out of Night Market. Now we are even. So, Reagan, you're sitting there and you're finishing up reading the uh, paper. We then cut over and... Talus, where are you now? You've just come in from the rain maybe 45 minutes ago after getting roughed up a little bit by uh, the City Watch. And, you know, obviously, you know, there's some connection here between uh, Reagan and uh, this uh, this Mickey gentleman uh, who's running it. Where would you be um, inside of your lair? Uh, I, this sounds like uh, making a coffee and trying to uh, get a hold on the, of the things. Like, you know, yeah. Uh, preparing the brew and like thinking about okay what's what's about to happen next then so uh we see you at, at kind of this really kind of crappy kitchenette that you guys have built in this basement and um kind of a cobbled together coffee press um the good news is is that everybody can now smell the coffee because I, I have a sneaking suspicion that Talos makes really, really good coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so um, can we describe Talos for the people listening and watching? So Talos is, uh, is a character who, who was a trader. So he knows how to, uh, how to appease to people and he knows how to look well. So he's able to put on some good clothes, but not this time. He's like... He, it could be the inverse rope, like on the other side, he has like nice clothes that he could put up like real quickly. But today, like uh, it's a coat, it's it's a scarf over his face, maybe like he, he wears it on the neck now, of course, because he's in more comfortable zone. And he's, uh, he's really uh, seems out of place. Like you can really see that he's not, he's not local, maybe a uh, dark skin tone a little bit. Uh, since he's coming from the island of, uh, what's it called? Iruvia? Iruvia, yeah. Yeah, it's Peruvian, right? Yeah. So, you're blowing on the cup of coffee, and you kind of test it, and the camera swings. It swings towards Galen. So where's Galen? In that case, Galen is 
leaning up against the wall behind Ish, the desk, uh, to where he could look over whoever's sitting their shoulder, but he knows better with uh, Reagan in particular <laughs> to do this. Okay. And let's uh, describe Galen. Galen is a weathered uh, man of... He's, he's broad and has the sense... You have the sense of he could hold himself in a fight, but he definitely prefers not to. He definitely prefers more of of talking, but that that face carries weight of consequences on it uh, from his time in the war doing things and potentially stuff. <laughs> All right. So Galen's standing there kind of um, in the same area as Reagan, but uh, being very, very conscious that Reagan doesn't feel in any way intruded on, right? Very respectful mm -hmm. of her personal space. The camera then is going to cut over to Elias. Uh, where would we find Elias? Elias is uh, set up up against a wall, a blank wall with not much uh, uh, on it. And uh, he's got himself almost like an apothecary set up with drawers and like a uh, the trunk opens on the top um, with a bunch of tooling and a bunch of gadgets and widgets. Um, and he's, he's cleaning and working on his gun. Um, uh, prepping himself and and, and uh, basically preparing for, for what's to come. All right, so let's cut back. And, uh, Reagan, I think you just finished reading. Mm -hmm. Well, that is very interesting. Uh, an old friend. Um, maybe might have told you about him. Not entirely sure. Wasn't that important. But some fun information. The important thing is, is did you get what you needed? Uh, that remains to be seen. I have something. I don't know if it's what I needed. Well, if you'd like, you can share it. And <laughs> I'll be more than happy to put out feelers. Uh, so the, the kind of dramatic reading I did earlier is now done for the room as a whole. Um, <laughs> oh, please repeat. Please repeat. Oh, so <laughs> no. I can certainly do that. Uh, if you missed uh, these the first time, I can do that. No. Um, <laughs> so I'll give everybody a little bit of a background. Um, so one, Silkshore, not near where you guys are, not near where your lair is, nor where, or where, um, uh, your normal hunting grounds are there in Night Market. It's a little bit farther away. Uh, Silk Shore is more canals than it is streets. Um, it's a location of a couple different things. It's where a lot of the red light district is. Um, there is also some very nice areas of Silk Shore as well, um, but they're separated out um, from each other. Uh, Lissa Frag. Um, she is related to your contact. Um, so maybe Roman, we can talk about, uh, the crew's main contact. Yes. Uh, our main contact is Adelaide Freud. Uh, the lady Adelaide Freud. She is a noble. And, uh, she is the eldest daughter of the Freud house. Her youngest sister, Lissa, uh, killed the former boss of the Crows, a, another gang, Rorik. Uh, and she now runs the Crows, and Adelaide does her best to protect her wayward sister, and for that purpose, the Umbral Means were uh, contracted, I guess would be the best word, uh, to kind of be her off-the-books fingers in the dark, if you will, to, to let her younger sister have her dreams and fun in this otherwise uh, bleak existence. All right. And now, Lissa Frag, all of you know uh, of her. None of you have met her before, but you know of her because she runs the Black Crows, which is a, a crew that's several tier, well, uh, two tiers above you. So a much bigger organization than just the four of you. Um, a bit of a scandal because she killed the leader and became the leader of the Crows. Um, more than um, garnering uh, more than just a little bit of attention. Um, within within uh, Dusk Bowl itself. And um, the, it is definitely something that's interesting 
and definitely something that um, probably your patron would be interested in. Well, if this information is out in the wild, it would uh, do for someone friendly to have it. And kind of looking up Galen, seems the sort of thing that you would like to know regardless. You're not wrong. All right, so Galen, I would assume you're going to reach out, right? Yes, I'm going to go ahead and, and put my feelers out and uh, see what else there is to find out before we run off and presumably either remove this evidence or something. Now, in your mind, uh, Galen, would you would would this be kind of a out on the streets and kind of find out what the talk is type of thing? Are you going to go right to the big sister? What is what is the plan? Given that this is information about a sensitive subject that we would prefer not to be further out uh, I would definitely do what we can to let Adelaide know uh, and see if she has any other information if she's not already aware of this she should be as our patron um, but yeah beyond that I would definitely uh Put a, a I would I would make a call over to my friend Celia. Okay. Uh, would, who's Celia? And see what she knows. Celia is a a friend of Galen's. Uh, Celia even steps. Uh, she runs the Evening Steps uh, newspaper, which on the surface is a nightlife publication for the night market where we normally hunt. Uh, rumor mill, rumor monger, rumor creator when necessary. Uh, and the journalists that work for her, uh, in addition to collecting that surface level information, definitely funnel blackmail and other information to her. So she kind of has her pulse on the, the wealthy, especially. Uh, and so if she knows anything about blackmail materials that could be used against our, our noble friend and her sister, she, she would be the one to know. And we can go from there. All right. So we're going to have our first roll of session one <gasps> of Blades in the Dark. So um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Blades in the Dark, one thing that's really, really neat about it is one of several things um, is uh, what uh, John Harper, who wrote, created this, calls the conversation. So normally in a lot of RPGs, I would tell Roman what he should roll. Uh, but that's not what we're going to do here. What um, I'm not going to tell Roman in anything. I'm just telling Roland, Roman, we need a roll. So the first thing that uh, you need to do, Roman, is state your goal. Are you wanting to do this as two separate roles or one? Well, it depends. Are we are we headed to uh, connect with your contact? I would assume there's a way that you she, don't normally... We don't need to roll for whether you can make contact. I assume mm -hmm. there's um, th that that happens, right, without without the need for a roll. So I think that it would be tied to really uh, the conversation. So once the contact happens, and once we do the roll, then we'll role play it. Okay. Um, I would say I'm going to go ahead and, and make my way over to the offices of the paper because I know that's where I can find Celia. And we'll go with, from there. That way, when we go reach out to Adelaide, we have as much information as we can, not just a, a scrap. Great, great. And uh, what do you think we should roll? I am thinking uh, this should probably be a consort, okay. since I will be socializing with a friend and contact. I agree. I agree. So... Um, I now, once we've done that, that you've chosen your action rating, right? So one of your action ratings is consort, which is the ability to socialize, the ability to have a conversation. Um, it covers a lot of different things, but it's kind of the general social friendly role. Um, so next we got to set the position. 
uh, there's three positions in Blades in the Dark. And just so everybody knows, we're not going to do this for every role. This is just for, I know a lot of people <laughs> watching, this is their first time. Um, you have three different things. You can have a controlled position, which means things are comfortable. Everything's pretty much okay. Galen's feeling pretty good. The person that Galen is interacting with or the people that, you know, things are in a good position. We could have risky, which is not controlled. And then we could have desperate. Uh, which this is not. So, Roman, I'm going to give you a controlled role with this. And then we decide, or I decide on the effect. And I'm going to say this is going to be a standard effect. Um, I think that this is um, a controlled situation. You're with somebody who you're very comfortable with. Um, I don't think she's going to tell you, um, you know, what's going to happen three hours from now. But she's going to be able to tell you what she knows. So I think it's going to be a standard effect. So now we've got to put together uh, the dice pool. So for, to start off with, how many dice do you have for your action? I have two in consort. Okay. Um, and you can, you have a couple options. One, uh, you can have somebody assist you, which means that they can spend some strain and we can have them there with you, potentially helping as far as this is concerned. Uh, you can push yourself, add some, add uh, two stress um, to your, um, situation and then add a die or are you happy with two dice i think we're gonna try the the two dice to start us out all right so let's do a consort roll so if you go to your character sheet you should be able to uh -huh. click on consort and remember it's going to be a controlled with standard and no additional dice all right all right nice. So, as you can see here, we roll d6s for this. And one, two, three is a failure. Four and five is a success with consequences. And then a six is just a success. And you, in this case, because we're doing, he's got two dice um, from his consort ability, we're going to take the highest of the two, which is really easy when they're the same. So, we're going to have a success with consequences. So, the consequence, Galen, is I don't think you're guaranteed she's going to keep this conversation to herself. So it's going to be a successful conversation, but you get the feeling as you're talking with her that um, she may not keep this to herself, which she has been known to do. Um, she's been an incredible mm -hmm. resource for you, but... Sometimes she can run her mouth. Um, and I don't think Galen has a very clear picture of how many pies this reporter has her fingers. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. very quickly, uh, Roman, you have the ability to resist that consequence if you'd like. Which means that uh, you can do a resistance roll and you can say, no, Craig, she is going to keep it to herself. And that just happens. <laughs> but it's going to add a certain amount of stress to you. So do you want to resist this or are you willing to accept the consequence? Is there a way to shape the consequence without getting rid of it? And let me let me kind of because again conversation. Walk me through it. Mm, I, yeah, I'm I'm feeling like she definitely like her her default is she's not necessarily going to keep it quiet, unless keeping it quiet benefits her more than not keeping quiet about it. Okay. But so that means if I can sweeten the pot either right now or in the near future. She could put a clock on, if you get me something juicier than this, then I keep quiet about this. Interesting. Interesting, <laughs> interesting. Um, all right, so you're talking with her, and you're saying, no, uh, this should be a clock, which incidentally, this a clock is something that we measure measure uh, things with. Um, all right, I'm willing to do that, Roman. So what I'm going to do on your character sheet, let's go ahead and start a uh -huh. clock. And um, uh, let's call it, uh, let's call it Celia's Patience. So if you don't okay. make this worth her while quick enough, um, then we're going to have the full consequence. And let's make this uh, a six segment clock. Okay. All right. And because for the consequence, I want you to fill in two of those, please. Okay. So we're two to, two to six to her running her mouth. Got it. 
Galen, Galen, what kind of trouble have you gotten yourself into now? Well, only about the usual amount. Uh, trying to keep a, a fellow leader of other upstanding citizens, shall we say, uh, out of out of the limelight. And uh, we've heard that someone has information that she'd rather not have around. Uh, and I was wondering if you maybe, knowing all that you do, had heard anything about this. And I would give her the, the information of that uh, townhouse uh, to kind of start her off. Sure. Uh, let's have you actually hand the note over. How does that sound? Sure. Okay, great. So she grabs the note, the, the, the paper from you and looks it over and she goes, where did you get this? Another contact of mine. Well, I mean, I can tell you a few things, I think. Um, one, uh, obviously, you know, Silkshore. The area circled on the little map that that's on here, that's a very nice area of Silkshore. And um, I think, I think that's Karth Oris's house, his townhome, his brownstone. Um, and Lissa, you know Lissa, um... You know, Koth is associated with the Hive. Lissa runs the crows. And uh, the Hive is not real happy with Lissa, obviously, because uh, the person who, you know, obviously runs the Hive, uh, that was her, his, his, his lover that she killed. So it doesn't surprise me if the, the Hive would have information uh, to get back at Lissa for. And it wouldn't surprise me that they wouldn't store it at uh, Oris' uh, home. So, I mean, this could be viable information. Um, I wouldn't be that surprised. Um, I don't know much more. I don't know what the information could be or what it would be worth. What do you know about defenses at that brownstone? Ooh, not much help there. I've never been. <laughs> I mean, the hive, you know, is, 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 is well-funded. So I would expect them to... Uh, to have a, a decent <laughs> amount of defenses. I doubt he has it laying on the table next to next to his saucer and tea. So, quick background. Uh, Carthoris, as she kind of iterated, um, part of the Hive, which is kind of a underground merchant-type shady group. Um, and they control most of Silkshore. They control a good bit of the uh, um, sex work uh, that happens in Silkshore. Um... You have never encountered Carthoris, um, but uh, the Hive is is a to give you a sense is a is a tier uh, four uh, uh, crew. You being tier zero, they're a lot more influential and a lot more powerful than you are. Um, where are you going to head back, Galen? If that's all she has, I would definitely uh, head back after uh, thanking her profusely and uh, giving her that sly nod and tip of the cap that says, give me a, a couple minutes and I'll have something else for you. Thank okay. you very much. Now we're even and I owe you one. All right, so Galen <laughs> comes back into the lair. Um, of course, soaking wet. Uh, and, you know, brush, brush the water off the coat and... Uh, <sighs> is there any more coffee left? And then kind of sit down and, and return the note to, to Reagan, mm -hmm. pointing as I uh, hand it over with one hand, pointing with the other. That is apparently Karth Oris's house. So we're dealing with the hive. And just so you guys know... Um... The Hive is already an, uh, one of the declared enemies of your contact, for obvious reasons, as I've explained. So right now, you're at a negative one relationship with them. Um, so you guys are familiar with the Hive. Mm -hmm. What uh, What does it mean, negative one? So if I meet them on the street, they just bruise me up? Or like... <laughs> Do you want to go find out? <laughs> so to, to answer your question uh vaslov um what it means is they're aware of you 
and they're aware of your association with Adelaide. So they might do business with you. Um, they're not going to help you um, without some incentive. Does that help? But no, if they yep. see you walking down the street, they're not going to beat you up and take your lunch money. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> um, Galen would also, as he's mentioning that to, to everybody, look at Reagan and go, do you have any sense on a timeline that this might be used actively? Uh, well, uh, as you saw, the information on the note wasn't thorough. But it would be worth having it uh, in a time frame, uh, a time frame that is pragmatic. Well, I think it's time we go talk to uh, Lady Freud then and see what she knows further. Or if she has any other plans for how to deal with this, because quite frankly, if we're going in there, we're not loaded for bear. <laughs> All right. So now I want to ask the question, um, are we going to go retrieve or try to retrieve this information? Not right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you might be surprised how quickly it's going to happen. So you go, okay. you guys connect with Adelaide, uh, Adelaide, mm -hmm. um, is not going to go and sit with you and have dinner. Um, yeah, naturally. It's going to be, you know, you talk to a person, that person talks to Adelaide, and there's a quick exchange back and forth. Very simply, it's communicated to you that she will take care of you if you're able to get this information for her. So, now what I want to do is I want to talk about how we are going to make this happen. So, you have the ability to um decide how you want to take this and so something that's great about um i'm going to say this phrase a lot something that's great about blades in the dark um <laughs> is uh this isn't shadow run where we're now going to spend the next three sessions planning how we're going to do this we make the decision we're going to go and we're going to retrieve this information and the only there's only a couple things that the crew needs to decide one is how they're going to do it so you have a couple different potential approaches you can do it via assault, which is basically do violence. Uh, deception, so trick, lure, manipulate. You can use stealth to try to trespass unseen. We can use a cult and engage into supernatural powers. We can use social, which is more negotiation, bargaining, and persuading. Or we can do transport, which is carry cargo and people through danger. I, so I'm going to eliminate transport. I don't think that that's going to happen. Um, so uh, AJO says uh, violence is always the answer. <laughs> says that everyone's collective character sheets. <laughs> so I'd like for the four of you to decide of assault, deception, stealth, occult, and social. What is going to be our approach? So it has to be one, not the combination like stealth and deception, right? There will be like major approach. Exactly. I'm sure we're going to end up using most, if not all, of these. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. But what is what is the main approach? Well, it is I'm stealth, general, I'm, isn't I'm, it, right? Yeah, I'm like I'm either stealth or deception, depending. Exactly. Exactly. That's why I mentioned like these two. Uh, like the question is what is what we focus more on do we prepare that we go there unseen if something happens we try to use our uh let's say charisma to get us through that mess or we go there open and basically it will be we will be known from the first minute that there is somebody new there but it might be just a you know guy fixing the plumbing <laughs> well i i think our best approach is uh, not assault because none of us are really bruisers. Uh, uh, my little thin frame in this world, not in real life, <laughs> is not going to be knocking down doors. So uh, I'm thinking stealth on my end uh, uh, with our current skill set, kind of help identify our our crew as a whole and, and what we do. Okay. Yeah, I'm agreeing. Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, stealth as the primary. 
probably a, a smattering of deception and maybe a cult in there too. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel like, yeah, I feel like distractions are going to be need to be made. So deception is sort of red, but like stealth is the stealth is like, uh, so just just uh, like insight into um, that, like how I I ran this is like I gave people like what is the um, uh, what is the best case scenario. And then that would help, like, in, inform that. So our best case scenario is literally like getting in, taking the information, leaving without ever, no one ever knowing we were there. It's not necessarily what's going to happen, <laughs> but it's what we're kind of, what we're kind of aiming for. Definitely. Yeah. All right. So we've decided on stealth. So next, mm -hmm. uh, I want to talk about our detail. So I need to know what the point of infiltration is. So according to the information that you got, both from Galen's contact as well as from the note, is that this is in his private residence, in his townhome, in a relatively nice part of Silkshore. Um, just because of what you know about Silkshore, though you've never been to this particular uh, location, is um, there are small sidewalk streets. They're not very wide. Most of um, the transportation and movement in this in in this part of Duskville happens via gondola and via via the canals itself it is set back from the kind of the main thoroughfares of silkshore so and in, in a nicer part of of silkshore uh so it's not going to be near a marketplace or a, a you don't expect this to be a very crowded area um the only people that are in this part of silkshore are the people that are supposed to be in this part of silkshore so what's our point uh, of infiltration? I like I'm liking the boat idea. Like <laughs> I was waiting for this to happen. So that's that would be my boat going through the canals on a gondola, maybe hidden under the blanket of like some transport cargo going through there and somebody could slip on the on the shores and maybe through the back entrance or climb up the window. Mm -hmm. I, I like it. I, I... I like your enthusiasm more. I love it. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. So very, very quickly, there's going to be one detail that we need to do before we set, set ourselves there. Before you can be on a gondola coming up to uh, Mr. Oris's home, I need to find out where the hell you got the gondola. The gondola store. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I, I know. Crazy. Gondolas are our us. Gondolas. Good yeah, on the my only bullshit comment of the night. So sorry. <laughs> I had to get out of early. Where are we getting a gondola? Because you don't own one. Uh -uh. True. I mean, I think even just doing it as like as a legitimate thing works. Like yeah. this is this is a way of travel. This is a way of moving things. We have like a stockpile of books that no one uses. So are we going to rent yep. one? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Done. Let's let's hire an Uber. <laughs> <laughs> so we see the four of them over a table kind of making these decisions. Um, Cornelius knows knows a guy, knows where they can get their hands on a gondola for, a, a, you know, a piece of a coin. And uh, you guys get some books and some boxes and you get to the gondola you load them on and you head off and immediately the camera cuts and we see the canals of silkshore now the first thing to understand is that the canals are not at street level they're a good story below street level so as you guys are pushing the gondola through the black ink colored waters all you have on either side of you are just alleys of stone. And if you look up, then you can see street level. And it's bridge after bridge as you guys are passing through. And it's happening at night, and that's because it's always night and duskful. But what time of day are we thinking? Are we thinking evening? Give me like, uh, using, using standard clock, 3 a.m., 3 o'clock in the afternoon, what are we thinking? See, I would think if they're, if the the hive are mercan, mercantilers of a sort, uh, you pick the time where he's more likely to be in the office rather than home. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I'm I'm thinking more, you know, just before lunchtime. Yeah, I was thinking noon. Yeah, exactly. 
I like it. All right, beautiful. So you can see from where you are, there's very little activity. Um, it's midday, and the people that live in this part of Silk Shore are in one of two places. They're either inside, having tea and living a life of comfort, or they're out making the money to allow them to afford to live in this part of Silk Shore. So we're pushing the gondola forward. There's the four of you in it with the supposed um, pile of crates. And you are now roughly, I would say, uh, maybe 40, 50 yards away from being at the base of Oris's home. Now, question. Is the architecture here, since they know they move so much stuff by gondola, while the street levels above us, do most of these homes have like a, a gondola level, I'm, I'm taking the, the gondola out for the evening level gondola entrance. Gondola porch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like a dock or something. Oh yeah, yeah, there's docks all along the way. All along the okay. way. So yeah, it's very easy for you to pull up um, as far or as close as you want. You can pull up and tie the gondola off. And then there's going to be usually a, a flight of stairs periodically along these canal walls that'll get you up to street level. Okay. I think we, give, given what we're doing, I think we probably want to go for closer rather than further away. Mm. Uh, just because the longer we're at street level, the more we're going to be obvious that we don't belong there. Right. Although I really like the idea of we, we brought some cargo with us as like, we're, we're a delivery service of mm -hmm. boxes full of bricks, <laughs> <laughs> etc. Um, so I think something like that of, of you know, carry, carry your box, look like a delivery boy or delivery crew, essentially, is what we're going for. All right. Um, one decision I forgot to do is loadout. So you guys have the option of uh, three different levels of loadout. Uh, so go into your character sheets. You can go, um, what is it, light? Let me look here real quick. Normal and heavy. Yeah, light, normal, and heavy. Three, five, six, five, five. So light would allow you to walk through the um, streets of Silk, Silk Shore, and nobody would immediately know you're up to no good. Now, granted, the four of you don't look like you belong here. But they wouldn't immediately say, well, he's obviously got thieves tools, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, standard means that you probably have got a bag with you um, or a case or something that um, doesn't make it look like you're just running to go get some bread at the market. Heavy means you're there to do something. <laughs> you are loaded <laughs> up um, for a purpose and it would probably get attention. So I'll start with Reagan. Reagan, how are you going to load? Uh, I, I think with the way that Reg operates, uh, she would very often just go light, especially with the the implication of this job being there's nothing... I don't have to pack a bunch of weird occult stuff if we're just, like, going and taking some documents. Hopefully, anyway. We'll see. But, like, that would be kind of... That'd be how she, how she played it. And thankfully, like, some of the weird... Some of the weird occult stuff uh, is actually uh, zero load. So there's things like masks and weird ghost keys, which I'm so excited to get into, um, <laughs> that uh, don't necessarily have um, uh, kind of get this load. So I'll, I'll be on light. All right, beautiful light. Uh, how about Talos? Talos is bringing like the normal load. He needs his tool bag, and without it, he feels naked. All so right. definitely normal for so me. So normal for Talos, lamplighter? Uh, also going light. Light and Elias. Oh. So I'm kind of uh, stuck between light and normal, depending on kind of our approach. I kind of need to know if we're going to be going in as a group and I'm going to be going in with y'all because I'm not going to need a big long rifle <laughs> and spyglass, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, my character most likely would be going for. Uh, uh, the, the the sniper rifle kind of doing the overwatch and, and observation and and uh, 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 try to keep you guys out of trouble so I think I'm gonna go 
I'm going to go with normal loadout. Okay, great. All right, so now we've got to do the engagement roll. And what the engagement roll is going to do is it's going to give us a sense, as you guys are pulling up, um, what kind of conditions are we starting off the score? Um, so, uh, first of all, um, I want Reagan to roll the engagement roll. Uh, but the uh, five of us are going to really talk through how many dice that uh, uh, Joe gets to uh, roll for her. All right, so you're going to get one die just for good luck. And let's talk about major advantages. Um, do you guys think this operation is particularly bold or daring? Yes. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because we're doing this with fairly minimal information, and we know for a fact that the person that we are burglaring is and uh, a member of a much, much bigger fish in the sea than we are. Gang right. speaking. Okay. It's also his own house. That's so. yeah. the tough part, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So I, I am mean, definitely. If this goes bad, goes bad. Like, yeah. All right. So that's going to give you an additional die. So there, I'm going to give you a die for that. Uh, the plan's detail exposes a vulnerability of the target or hits them where they're the weakest. What do we think? Doing it while he's presumably at work doing. Uh, so he, he, hopefully, he's not in the house. Um, like, servants and stuff is more likely what we'll have to deal with. Uh, that, that seems a, a, as optimal a situation as we could, could have. Mm -hmm. And especially with our, our cover story of we're here to deliver whatever these boxes are. So I'm, I don't think I'm going to give this one to you. And the reason being is um, we don't know how uh, vulnerable yeah. this house is, <laughs> right? That's, that's fair. So I, I'm going to say no to that. So we're still at two dice. Um, did we use friends and contacts to provide aid and insight? Yes, you did. So that's going to be a third die. Um, is the target lower tier? No. Uh, is there any <laughs> district modifiers? There's no district modifiers. You guys do not have any type of uh, presence or anything here. So that puts us, what, at three dice right now, right? So let's talk about disadvantages. Is the operation overly complex or contingent on many factors? I don't think so. Is the target as strong against this approach, having particular defenses or preparations? Big question mark. We don't know. Uh, but, uh, all right. Um, I'll keep you at three. Enemies, rivals, interfering okay. in the operation. That one I'm going to take a die away from because of your con connection mm -hmm. with the hive. So I'll put you at two die. Is the target a higher tier? The target is a higher tier. So that's going to be a die. And still no district modifier. So we're at how many dice? One die. We're at one die. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. This is going to go great. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is a bad result. So you guys rolled a two. This puts you in what's considered a desperate position when the action starts. So what I'm imagining is you guys pull up and you were kind of hoping for kind of a legitimate place to tie off the the gondola that would give you a little bit of distance, right? Um, but the closest one that there is is actually right directly under Oris's home. So you guys could pull in, you tie it up there, you start pulling... Uh, Pull in the boxes to do your little fake, uh, you know, Domino's delivery. And immediately from up above you, three three heads lean over. Big gentlemen, all with caps on. Oi! What you for doing? You ain't parking here. Word. Delivery is in the back then. What you delivering? I don't ask questions, mate. I just go where the boss tells me. We ain't got no deliveries scheduled. Move along. Put all your stuff back in your boat and move along. If you say so, but, uh... I don't think Mr. Oris is gonna appreciate not getting whatever it is he ordered. I mean, we can dump it here in the river, I guess, and just be on our way. 
maybe if that if that's better for you, gentlemen. What are we gonna what are we trying to do with these gentlemen? Well convince them that uh, it's legit, right? Yeah, we, like we, we are know. actually doing the delivery, they just do not know because they are just <laughs> just goons. We, Chilling we out yeah, to... just goons. Yeah, we are go. trying to, to sway them that we are in the right and they are being over paranoid. Okay, so we're, we want to do a sway. Um, who's going to who's going to be doing the swaying? I have a point in it. Anybody got better? I got the uh, two points in sway. Oh, nice. Oh, I thought you got two as well. No, I have, I have two in consort. I, I talk nicely to nicer people. You, you talk oh, nice you to, nice, to nice upset approach. people. Yes. <laughs> All right, so so Cornelius is our sweet talker. Uh, he's going to do our sway roll. Uh, so Cornelius, uh, you've got two dice. Um, I'm going to say this is definitely a desperate position um, in my mm -hmm. mind. Uh, more than just risky. Uh, they're very well aware that the four of you don't belong here. These guys are well aware of the schedule. They know when boats are coming. They know when boats are going. They know for a fact, because they do this for Oris, that you are not supposed to be here. And if you don't convince them, the, uh, things are going to go bad. Because they are well aware of what Oris is, does. He's, they're well aware of his enemies and the threats that are available to him. That's why he's got three goons that are watching the canal. Mm. So this is definitely going to be a desperate position, but I'm going to say great effect. Because I think if you pull this off, they're going to let you bring some boxes into the house. All right. Now at I this point, for, like those, for those listening and for everybody that's new to this, they could make changes now. Right, so I've set the position and the effect. If if Talus uses sway, now Talus could say, you know, or Vasilevs could say, I want to use something else. <laughs> right? Is that going to change things? Or potentially, maybe Reagan jumps in, or Galen, or, or Elias. So by no means are we committed to this yet. The conversation is still happening. But if you are going, if Cornelius, if Talus is going to sway, it's going to be a desperate action with great effect. Uh. Are there options that I could push it, like for to get some some extra die at least? So you could push, and you could do two things. You could push it to add a die to get you to three, or you could push it um, to increase the effect. Uh, you're already at great, so I don't think you, there's no, no no reason to push there. But no, okay, the risk cannot be reduced or the position. Yeah, this is desperate either way. The good news is is yeah. that if you pull this off. Uh, even actually, if you just make the roll, you don't even have to win it. You're gonna get an XP in uh, sway. No. <laughs> so, <Brilliant>. <laughs> so you got that going for you, which is nice. <laughs> of course, you'll be dead. But could I? <laughs> is it possible to potentially apply uh, some some item? I could have like forged documents that would be uh, listing me for a hasty delivery, like last second Uber Eats, you know, style. All right. So, I still, like, I have a document in my inventory, so I that would be one uh, one item I might use to help me out in here. Well, uh, you don't have to say. Are, so, are you asking if you had that document? Would it would it change things? No, no. If I uh, like, if I understand correctly, I have like whatever items I need. But once I use them, I take them that I took them, and it would take one of my slots, right? Oh, it would definitely, uh, no, if you had documents, it wouldn't take a slot. And and the way that this works, so we're, what we're talking about is a flashback, right? So what we're going to say is, well, actually, Craig, I thought of this situation. And I, an hour and a half ago, forged some documents or got some documents forged, however you're going to acquire these things. And instantly, you're going to have them in your hand. Now, there'll be a cost uh, for that in, in stress. Um, but the real question that you want the answer to is, that, will it change the conditions of the role? Yes. Um, and the answer is yes. It would make it risky. Okay, I would go that way. Then that makes sense to me that I would go and really uh, forge some documents, prepare something ahead of time, and I uh, would just take the crumbled documents with me and uh, reduce the position. <laughs> all right. So, all right, we'll make this a risky roll then. 
Um, let's talk about the flashback. So we cut back to the planning. The t you guys are around the table. You've got a map of Duskville in front of you, the Silkshore District. You're talking about this. Talos, what do you say? Gentlemen, this will be no easy to get in. So we know we want to get there like as a as a transport uh, uh, ship and or as a transport boat and for sure there will be somebody guarding it. And I don't think we can just waltz in and say, oh, hey, our boys and and true. Uh, let me think of like, let, let's do something like there is a lot of trade there, maybe like a lot of things going in the house, maybe a lot of things going out for sure. It will be where very well checked so i'm thinking let's invest uh, some time i will prepare a document that would help us to get in and i will try to play it in a way that it would be something that's last minute and the guys the, the goons that will be guarding it might not necessarily know about it immediately and it could buy us time even before they realize that this is all fake and something we would be long gone by then all right, so Definitely the other three like gentlemen sure. are like, great idea. <laughs> so you head off, uh, Cornelius, and you're going to prepare this this forged document. So we're going to need a roll. Um, now, I would say this is a two-stress flashback, but I'm going to have you roll, so we're going to make it just a one-stress flashback, okay? So you're only going to call... This is only going to cost you one stress, but we are going to need to roll, and uh, the position is going to be controlled. This is not the first time that you have... Um, create any documents. Um, what are you going to use to create these documents? Uh, I'm thinking of tinkering. Like it's a it's a using of like you know fine writing using it's the tinkering. correct pens. Yeah, I completely pens. agree. So it's this pens. is going to be controlled with a standard effect. Um, uh, so you are going to have uh, two dice by default. And what this is going to do is to give you an idea of the effect standard effect. It's going to work. So if you succeed on this, they're going to believe these documents. Um, a one to three, <laughs> and the unbeknownst to Cornelius as he's handing this paper up to the gentleman, it's not very good. Do you want okay. to push yourself for two stress? Yes. Okay, is there anybody that wants to aid Cornelius? But for one stress, that'll give him another die. Yeah, I'll go ahead and aid Cornelius. So how does Elias how is Elias able to help Cornelius forge documents? What is what does Elias bring to the table? Uh, Elias is bringing another confident person on that boat, uh, carrying a, a crate, a box of some sort um, that has a similar document that was created for maybe every one of those boxes, and uh, he grabs his papers and says, "Here, boss. Here, here's here's my." Uh, BOM for this for this transport. Uh, 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 share it with these guys so we can get this job done. So your I like that because your aid is not happening at the creation of the documents. Your aid is happening after the flashback, which I love because remember what we're rolling for now is how convincing that these documents are going to be, right? Oh, and what gotcha. you're saying okay. is what you're doing is making them even more convincing, right? So I'm totally good gotcha. with that. So go ahead, Elias, and add one stress. Okay. For aiding, so that's going to put an. Uh, you have one stress, um, Cornelius, for the flashback. And then are you going to push yourself for two more stress? So I, I ticked off three stress on the ship. Okay. So that's going to give you four dice. So I go to Tinker. I press on the yep. Tinker. You... I select Control, right? Yep. And then the and effect is standard. Effect standard. And, and then four you're dice, adding right? two. You're at, well, you're adding two more dice. So it's going to ask you for additional dice. Oh, it's dice. counting two, so I'm putting plus two. Correct. Okay. Let's do this. Very nice. Oh, yes. Very nice. <laughs> so, Elias, we now go back. Note, and I, I saw only the three, and I was like... <laughs> 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 so we got a six. We take the highest of these four. So Elias, you do your shuffling around. You say, here, boss, here, boss, here's the paperwork. And you're grabbing them off the boxes, handing them over to him. Cornelius, you, you get, you've got these papers. What are you doing? Now, you guys, again, remember, you've, you're pretty far down. You're a flight of stairs down from these gentlemen. So I'm telling you right now, get back in the boat. You guys aren't supposed to be here. Gentlemen, this is last second delivery. We have all the necessary paperwork that I'm sure your boss needs. 
You can come here and check it for yourself. There is the list. I will be handing it to him, making it clear that from from where he's looking at us down, he sees like he could vaguely see the correct, you know, bureaucracy stuff on it. And I will get. Oh, and we have this extra uh, extra documentation about the packages. Like it's everything. Everything is here. I don't want to mess up, mess with you guys. I see that you're doing your job quite well, but see, we're just we're just the delivery guys. Right. We have all the proper documents. Now you guys straight up succeeded here, so I'm going to ask you a quick question because I, I I don't want to take away from your success here. Do you guys want all three of them to come down and check the papers, or would you prefer if just one down to come check the papers? The papers are going to work. Hmm. What's better for you? Because this was a this was a six. It was a straight up success. I think. Uh -oh. Maybe one one pair. Sorry, if I'm taking over this, um, it might be better to have one pair of eyes on the documents and then like get that, uh, get them to assist, uh, bring the others down mm -hmm. to assist with bringing it in. So yeah. kind of both. <laughs> but you want yeah, you want to no, start like with that. just one guy coming down, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So the guy who's been yelling at you goes, "Oh, Colbert, go down there and check those documents." So. Guy come, there's sta stairs are kind of built into the canal, so he kind of comes down the flights of stairs. He's a big dude. <laughs> big, burly guy, wide chest. Not a lick of hair on his on his head. Um, and it, like, really oddly, he's got a tie, and and you can, like, he does, you can just, as he's going down the steps, he's, <laughs> he just, he does not like wearing ties. And his shirt is a little too small and it's hard to tell whether that's on purpose or not right is he one of those guys that purposely wears a shirt that's a little too small to make him look a little bit bigger than he is or is he kind of an idiot who doesn't know how to wear a shirt that fits him <laughs> so he's coming down uh, corbett's coming down and goes give me the papers he grabs the papers from me looks it over and he goes what oh, why is us why doesn't us tell us about this and boss I mean, these, these look legit. It looks like this is a legitimate delivery. All right. All right, bring the stuff up. And yeah, each of us will get a crate and we'll get on the, in their yard and start bringing them in. All right. Nice. Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. Sounds good to me. Good. All right, so each of you guys grab a box uh, and you follow Corbett up the steps. And you get to Oris' home. And Oris' home is somewhat unique. So as you look on either side of the streets, and remember that it's not really a street, it's more of a very slight sidewalk, and then there's the canal. Um, and unlike Star Wars, there's railings. Um, when you guys are looking, <laughs> when you guys are looking at the buildings... Ocean exists in Duskfall. It does. Duskfall has railings. Um, you look at uh, the other homes that are here on the street, and... It's all of them have steps leading up to a door, right? Um, some are nicer than others. But his is, uh, Oris is a little unique because there's a gate and there appears to be like a small yard on the other side of this gate. And then you can see the home rising above. So the walls themselves are about six foot tall. Um, big guy grabs the papers out of uh, Corbett's hands, looks at him. All right, so all these are going in the kitchen then. Day. The papers well, say here you got produce. Is it all going in the kitchen? Or you're storing it? What are we doing here? I don't have time for this. The produce is going in the kitchen. But there's one of these other ones that says it's tea. And apparently that's supposed to go to his office. There's tea? Wait a second. Oh, oh yeah, that's tea. Yeah, okay. All right. I want you in and I want you out. Corbett's going with you. So he opens up the gate. Corbett's walking behind you and he leads you guys in. So you guys walk into now into this courtyard. And there's no grass at all. It's all stone, cobblestone, um, but it's nice. And conditions-wise, the, the home itself is beautiful and it looks to be about six stories tall. It's a large oak door, several steps up. Corbett gets ahead of you, opens up the door says come on come in we'll go we'll do the kitchen first 
walks you into the room. So the first thing you see is this gorgeous hallway. This is the nicest place the four of you have ever been inside. <laughs> like everything matches. Like everything was put there on purpose. It's not just pictures that he found. He bought these pictures and he hung them on the walls. And the furniture and the tables that line the hallways are all there. He leads you to the kitchens in the far back, goes past several doors, some open, some closed. You see some living areas, a library, takes you to the back, opens it up to the kitchen. But the box is down there. There's two people working in the kitchen, two ladies. Put the boxes down there! Yeah, okay, right. So, yep. right here, like, on top of each yeah, other? Just put them right there! Up. Who's got the tea? I've got the tea. Alright, come here! You, you, you guys stay here! Only him and I are going into the office. Alright, come with me! Oh, boy. Cool. So he walks down the hallway... You hang a right to another hallway and there's a staircase. You guys go, you, the two of you walk up to a staircase. While this is happening, I want to cut back to the kitchen. What are the three of you gentlemen doing in the kitchen? What are we doing? So who's there with us as well in the kitchen? <laughs> so it's just the three of you and two ladies that are peeling carrots and potatoes. Do we get a coffee while waiting for our friend? <laughs> <laughs> uh, part of me wants to cause a... Uh a distraction to try to get this thug back downstairs as uh, uh, Galen is upstairs with a box. Um, so I'm just going to go with it. Uh, as I'm trying to figure out where this box is supposed to be going, I, I, I commit to just falling right into it, into a wall, maybe up against a, 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 a table that has some china set something. Oh, I guess there's no china set in there in uh, Blades in the Dark, but uh, something porcelain or that can break and just totally Chris Farley bam through the box, <laughs> the, 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 the table, into the wall, maybe uh, oranges or mushrooms. I know that's a thing in this world. Mushrooms <laughs> go flying everywhere, just causing a ruckus, making as much noise as I possibly can. So there's the, the, the two women that are in the kitchen, they're peeling carrots and potatoes. One, one's an older woman. Um, you'd say, you know, late fifties, early sixties. Actually, that's young, by the way, that's not old. Um, she's there. And then there's a much younger woman who's obviously late teens, um, who's there as well. And you crash into it and believe it or not, <laughs> I'm going to need a roll. So, and the role is, is to figure out how successful of a racket you're able to create because the goal here, right? So let's go through, let's go through like the process. The player states his goal and your goal, if I understand things correctly, is you're trying to create enough of a ruckus to get Corbett to leave Galen alone upstairs and come down. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So that's our goal. So what is your action? Oh, <laughs> I hate that I don't have any pips next to it. Oh my god. Uh, <laughs> AJO4949 oh said. <laughs> AJO4949 AJ in chat says, Oh, O came for the violence. <laughs> <laughs> violence against mushrooms. <laughs> Um, the only thing I could think of would be wreck, even though I'm not great at it. I think I think wreck sounds reasonable. So if you were to do wreck, um, I think this is definitely risky, right? Um, uh, for f effect, I'll say st standard effect. Standard effect. Um, because I don't think that even if Cor if Corbett runs down the stairs and runs into the kitchen and sees Chris Farley has torn up half of the half of the kitchen and is covered in pots and pans and mushrooms, I don't think he's going to help you. I think what he's going to do is immediately go, "Holy crap! I left somebody up in the office," and so I think you're only going to end up buying Galen at tops, maybe 60, 70 seconds. 
So I think it's just going to be standard effect um, for that. So if you are if you want to use Wreck here, I'll give you a risky roll for standard effect. All right. Uh, I think I'm going to try to push myself since okay. I'm a quote-unquote slender man. So uh, you're going to go ahead and go... Push pretty hard. Yep, so you're going to go two, take two stress, and instead of having two dice, take the lowest because you have nothing in Wreck. That's going to give you one die. Now, Carlos will try to assist. Maybe it will be that he comes to talk to the ladies and accidentally turns up the heat on, on the <laughs> stew brewing and it starts uh, maybe uh, boiling a bit too much and the water goes out of the pot. So it creates even more mess and nobody pays attention okay. while this guy is falling. So. Okay. You're going to add to the chaos, Cornelius? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So to take one stress, that's going to give you two dice, Elias. All right. What's Reagan doing? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, at this point, watching a lot of this occur, um, <laughs> this seems this seems all on brand at the moment. Um, she's like she's she's not very good at like the kind of um, uh, like the face to face subterfuge. So she is kind of like busying herself, like trying to get into this role of like. I am a delivery person. I am doing the things that a delivery person would do. I've never done this job. I've never done any other job apart from the other thing. Reagan's hoping to get an hoping to get an Emmy award for her performance as a delivery person. <laughs> All right, so I think that gives for you her role in breaking into a man's house. <laughs> so Elias, you're going to choose Wreck, and we said okay. risky, and we said risky. standard. But you're going to add two additional okay. uh, two additional dice because you've pushed yourself and you're getting uh, some extra mayhem assist from uh, from Talos. Would Devil's Bargain help in this way, or is it either or? No, we can also do a Devil's Bargain if you'd like. So another mechanic in the game is the Devil's Bargain, which is basically Nick is asking for an extra die, and I need to. Give him an offer that he really wants to refuse. <laughs> the devil's bargain. So, Nick, you can have another die. The devil's bargain is, is if this... If you succeed, you're not only going to bring Corbett down and leaving Galen alone for about 90 seconds, but the two other guys that are outside are also going to hear the racket and they'll also come in. And, and head to the kitchen. And that's if you succeed. Or fail. <laughs> Is that worth an extra die? I'm looking for facial expressions, guys. <laughs> and girl. It's your bargain. <laughs> Is YOLO a thing in Blades in the Dark? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Screw it. That's, Let's do it. It's called taking a devil's bargain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes things interesting. Yeah. All right, so that that, that, that gives you a third extra die, Elias. So you're going to choose wreck, and you're going to add three additional dice. Right. All right, we ready? All right, Lord, bear me strength. You bet we are ready. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the animation. Had one, the one die was on a five, and another die hit it and rolled it to a six. <laughs> yes. All yes. right. So, Elias, you, Corn you look at Cornelius. You both kind of go, nod. <laughs> Cornelius, you go over. You've turned the heat up on the water, and you can hear them going up the steps, and it starts to boil over. And, and the older woman is like, oh, oh, oh my, oh my, oh my, oh my. And she walks over there and, and you pretend to like want to help her. And you end up like knocking the hot boiling water stew all over the counter. And the, the younger woman is like, oh my God. And as soon as that happens, <laughs> Elias just footballs into a rack of pants and Clang! And they just <laughs> crash down on top of you, and it's just this deafening noise. We flash back to Galen. Galen, you're walking up here with Corbett. Corbett goes, "Oh, you got the you got the tea." Okay, I can get my voices right. You got the tea. All right, put put the tea right on the desk. And he opens up the door, and you can see um, Oris's office. 
and he points over to the desk. As soon as he points to the desk, you hear this crash from downstairs. <laughs> and Corbin goes, ah, what the hell is going on? All right, don't you do a single thing. Stay right here. I'll be right back. And he turns around and he takes off. You guys, through the crashing and everything, you can hear the front door opening and you hear the footsteps running towards the kitchen. Let's go back to the kitchen. You're on the floor, Elias. Cornelius, you're like like pretending to help, but just making it worse. Just making it worse. Go, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Just let me help with this. And I'm blocking her to trying to do something. And there's not enough space around. And like, maybe if I just, just let me get a, like, I mean, I, I'm just going around and trying to really block them around. And they... They don't know what to do, and the stew, and, and the fire is on the stove, or whatever that is. You push a towel onto the fire, yeah. and the towel sets on fire. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you're like, I'll, I'll get a mop, and you grab the mop, and it, boom, you knock the younger woman in the head <laughs> with the mop, with the mop thing. Elias, you're on the ground covered now in, in pots and pans, and first Corvus shows up, and he's like, what the hell? And then the two other guys come in, and, and it goes... He kind of pushes Corbett to the side. He goes, what in the hell is going on here? We're going to cut back to the library. Or not the library, to the study. Galen, you're there. You just saw Corbett run down the hallway, go down the steps. Mm -hmm. So I am going to go ahead and quickly but methodically survey this office to find where a, a powerful man like our, our uh, target here would be keeping uh, information that he plans on using in a reasonable amount of time. Um, I'm not necessarily looking for like secret safe. This is his house. He's, right. He's very obviously secure in his position within the, the hive to have someplace like this. He's much more, I expect him to do this more as an office rather than a, a secret underground. Okay. Everything's behind a painting. So right. I'm, I'm more looking for which which drawer is this kept in for his easy access. So, uh, well, I, I, so I, all right. So let's let's. So the goal, because you don't know what's in here, right? True. Okay. So so I think the goal is is to figure out where, um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, because this is the conversation we're having. Is the goal mm -hmm. to fi figure out whether the information is in this room? Yes. Okay. All right. That is going to be a. It's going to be a desperate action. And here's why okay. I think it's a desperate action. I think it's a desperate action because he was very clear to you. He told you, stay here. Don't do anything. I'll be right back. And if you fail this mm -hmm. um, and he finds you in this office, not standing there in the doorway where he left you, that's probably going to be a bad situation. So I think it's definitely okay. desperate. Um, you're going to use You're going to use survey, right? Yes, and actually, how's I? Would this be a good time to suggest a flashback uh, for why that would not make it a desperate action if they come back mid me doing what I'm doing? Okay, well, talk to me about the flashback. So, we knew going in that just getting in the door isn't going to get us everything. We need time to figure out where this thing is, and that means we need a little leeway. We know he's part of the hive. We know the hive are. are a large enough gang that they probably don't all know one another on site. So, to continue with our forgery idea here, uh, other than the fact that I'm not the one forging this, uh, Galen has uh, found through some of his channels, he has procured a an item, like a badge of office that the Hive would use, except they're not the type to use badges. I'm sure it's a signet ring or something of that idea he has procured one of these so the symbol of the hive is a bee mm -hmm. um and they don't have membership cards um so what could we what could you get your hands on galen because there's not going to be a <laughs> a business card with the hive written on it what, what could mm -hmm. you have that you think would convince somebody that you're actually part of the hive i'm thinking that uh I would have 
uh, again, I'm, I'm thinking a... Ooh, actually, no, not a ring. I'm thinking a uh, necklace that has a B on it, but that's not enough. With that, in this crate of tea, I have some honey, which given everything else that is, is going on here, that can't be cheap. That's not something you're going to no, just true. come across and everybody's yep. going to get. But it seems like, given their, their name, that's something that these guys would pride themselves on having. Okay. So between this and the honey, I can go, I was sent here in order to move this information along. I need it. This is part of a job that you're not aware of. All right. So how, what are we going to roll? So this is going to be one stress because it's going to require a roll. Um, mm-hmm. And... Trying to think of the goal. I don't think, it, regardless of what it is, Galen can get his hands on it, right? I'm not worried mm-hmm. about that. I think, I think what's at risk here is that you got good information, mm-hmm. right? Um, so that might change your action role. Um, what are you thinking in order to get it? You're look, trying to figure out what could I use to convince somebody I am in the hive. Yeah. And ultimately, again, like uh, like Nick did with Elias, it's less about the thing and more my performance. Okay. So I think it, it, it behooves me on this information to have studied their uh, sign countersign protocols, uh, which means I would have either had to have gotten information about how that works within the hive or have watched them do it. And, and you're a spider. So I think that you'd be able to do that. So I'm good with that. So you're going to want to use study. Um, this is going to be a desperate action too. Mm-hmm. I'll take that. <laughs> but it's going to change the other role, right? <laughs> um, if you're successful here. So let's say, because you won't, because this is going to tell you whether what's in your back pocket, quote unquote, for, uh, is going to be good or not. So let's make this the desperate role with great effect. Okay. How many dice uh, do you I have? Will. I have one currently, and I will totally push myself. All right, so you're going to take a total of three stress. One's for the flashback, and then two to push yourself. That's going to give you two dice. Okay. <sighs> Is the accept a devil's bargain an or or an and? <laughs> no, it's a, it would be an and. Okay. What what you got for me, bargain-wise? <laughs> um, regardless of whether you succeed or fail... They're going to figure this out, right? Mm -hmm. And they're going to probably, after all is said and done, whatever this pennant is, thing of honey, or whatever it is that you come up with to prove the hive, they're going to put it to somebody who's a little bit smarter than these three goons. And these these three goons are going to be in trouble. Because the conversation is going to be, you thought he was part of the hive? What are you, freaking (laughs) stupid? Look at this. What do you think? that you Do you think we have membership cards? He wore a <laughs> necklace and he had a vial of honey and now he's in the hot. Like, so these three goons are going to remember you and, and you maybe not with the whole, your reputation with the whole hive is going to be determined later based on how the score goes. It's going great by the way. Um, but these three goons specifically are going to, if they see you on the street, if they hear your name, and figure out your name. You are in trouble. That's your devil's bargain. I will take that. All right. How many dice does that bring you to? I can. I can also throw in an assist if we'd like. Yeah, I, I'm sure he would like that. I have an idea, <laughs> I have an idea for one. Um, so as as we're in this flashback, like um, at Lamplighter brings up, this is the thing that uh, he's he's looking to acquire. Uh, Reagan just kind of thinks back to like seeing commanding officers take very specific shipments for blue coat usage and the kind of either like call and response or like coded like uh coded language of like this is where you place this thing and that like means your payment is within uh, a certain location I-, I like it reagan in fact i think when you were in your time as a blue coat you saw some of the dirtiness in fact you saw it with our with our buddy right with mick you saw Mick interact with the blue with the hive before, and you could tell it was with a hive because they would reach in to their shirt and they would pull out a little pennant that's a bee, 
shape of a bee on it. And they would put it down. So if Mick ever questioned them whether this was the person I'm supposed to be talking to, more than a few times you saw them do this maneuver. So totally with that. So take one stress. That gives uh, that gives Galen another another uh, role. So Galen, you you've gone out. You have found out about this in conversations with Reagan and stuff. You need to get your hands on one of these pennants. You get you get one of these pennants. It's not an actual one. Right, so you've gone to a couple different stores, a couple different uh, pawn shops, and you're like, "Yeah, it kind of looks like a bee." Okay, <laughs> I want to figure out how convincing this uh, pennant is going to be. Okay, so we're going for we're then going study, study, and plus risky three dice then, or desperate, mm -hmm. and then uh, with great effect. Okay. And total of plus three dice. One for pushing. Mm -hmm. You got an assist and you took the devil's bargain. So three dice. Cool. Oh. <laughs> wow. So in the game of Blades of the Dark, a six <laughs> is a success. Two sixes is a critical success. Galen, I don't know how this happened because really when you were doing this, I don't even think you knew. But you went to a couple different pawn shop type things and curios and things like that. And you're, you're like, show me your necklaces. Do you have any necklaces with bees on it? And they're pull out trays of stuff. And you're like, no, no, no. So you go to the next one and no, no. And you're like, uh, you know what? This, this looks good enough. It's an actual hive necklace. <laughs> It's the real deal. <laughs> you don't even know that, though. You're just like, yeah, it looks good. <laughs> you bring it back to Reagan, and you show it to Reagan, and Reagan's like, well, that looks pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that should work. <laughs> and you put that on your neck, and you guys, you guys head out for the, the, head out for the score. So now we're back. You're in the office. You kind of touch your chest a little bit because you don't know you know you don't have a whole lot of time. You're making sure you didn't forget it, and you didn't. You can feel it there, and you start surveying the, the office. So now it's definitely not desperate anymore. So by the way, uh, keep track of your desperate rolls. So that's a desperate roll for your Galen because when we do XP, you got to remember what desperate rolls you took. Um. Okay. So yeah, you feel you feel the nexus. So that changes this from desperate to risky. Uh, okay. So if you it, it, now they're still going to figure it out. That was the devil's bargain. Mm -hmm. But you now getting caught here is not going to put you in a desperate situation. It's going to put you in a risky situation if you do get caught. Okay. All right. So what, uh, what, I would go ahead and push myself again for this one because I know okay. it's it's pretty key. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that's one we'll additional die and, and stick. Yep, I think. We'll chance it. We'll, we'll chance it with just the two for the for the survey. So you're not going to take the stress? Oh, isn't, isn't that what I'm, I'm taking the stress for pushing myself, isn't it? Oh, yeah, you are. Okay. All right. Yeah. So where does that put you? Does that put you at five after that? That puts me at five total, yeah. Okay. All right. Five. Or risky. Risky, great effect. Because this is what you're here for, yeah. right? Yep. And one die. Nope. All right. So. It had to happen once at least. All right, I'm going to uh, talk about what the serious complication is later on this failure. So, um, uh, Galen's going through, you're pulling desk drawers, uh, you're going through the desk trying to see if there's any compartments, knocking on the bottom of drawers, pushing, pushing, keeping an ear out, right? Keep listening for footsteps going up there. You're pulling out drawers, things like that. There is no sign, like, it's pretty obvious that Oris doesn't use this as an office. There's not like any papers or here or pencils or anything. Like, it seems like this is a show office. Like, I, you're uh -huh. not even convinced that he uses this as an office. He just knows that he's supposed to have an office. 
So he bought some really nice furniture to make it look good. Like, you even look at the books, and their books are just like, you know, encyclopedias, one through five, because it filled up a whole, uh, you know, row, and it made it look like he reads. Um, so, yeah, you're not able uh, to, to figure out this in. And Corbett walks in. Good. I was very specific. I told you to stay right here. What are you doing there? Now, the good news is, is you're standing there. You're not, drawers are not open. You were able to close the drawers and you're just standing there behind the desk. So he didn't see you go through the desk, but he's not, not at all happy. What are you doing here? Uh In, in the same motion as he's starting to say, what are you doing here? I just kind of have a thumb and I'm lifting out of my shirt, the, the B and going, and I've, I completely consciously change my, my mannerism and standing as he's doing this very much a more like, I, I was clearly faking being a workman before, you idiot, kind of a, a visage on my face. Okay. Because, yeah. And and much more of a posh voice. Let's see if I can actually change vocal gears here. <laughs> um, clearly, I'm here for some work for your boss's real job. And this is not the office you were supposed to bring me to. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So he sees you pull the necklace out. And he goes, Oh! Shows you his. We definitely need a roll, though. (laughs) Yeah, we do. (laughs) (laughs) What is Galen gonna do? Is this going to work? Um, I don't know. So we've got uh, some tense moments happening up in the uh, office. And uh, we've got some craziness happening down in the kitchen. Make sure you watch part B of session one. And uh, that's going to let you find out whether any of this is going to work. Thanks for watching.